Um, okay, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a slightly different approach uh, from the earlier sessions, and I'm actually going to come from this very much from a heritage management point of view, and very much about the stuff that's out there. Uh, so what, how, why is it we got here? Why, how have we got here? And what do we, we actually do? And I'm going to do that by posing some intriguing things for you. So uh, just to get you where I come from, I'm going to look at a piece of sculpture and ask some questions about sculpture, a, a war memorial, and, and a gravestone. Okay? Why? What is it? Where do those things come? And when we get hopefully through to the end, um, we might pick those up and you might have an understanding of where I, where I come from on, the, on this issue. I think the first thing I want you to get across, what's really important about this subject, is um, what is heritage and what does it represent? Well, the first thing you've got to understand is it represents what we have wanted it to represent since we started saying there was heritage, since we actually started designating it. So in 1882, the Ancient Monuments Act designated this stuff, ancient monuments. We called them ancient. We had them before history because basically we didn't actually have to think about them. This is beautiful, simple, safe heritage. No one's alive, no one can tell us what they were about, okay? So again, we, through time, have actively been very active in deciding what is and what isn't heritage. And this slide just represents how that conversation has changed over time. So basically, if I did 130 years of heritage history, you go from a uh, stone circle to Park Hill Flats, Europe's largest designated heritage thing. Okay? And basically in that, the process of heritage has changed fundamentally and how we, how we look at things and what we look at things. But it is still something that um, a very defined set of people do and talk about. The other thing when we think about heritage is we've been obsessed over the last 130 years of this idea that heritage is good for you, it's happy, okay? We're going to give you a product, and we're going to give you a days out experience, okay? Right, this is Revo Abbey in 2000. This is the same part of Revo Abbey in 1930. And what you're actually looking at there is what the Ministry of Works did to Revo Abbey to create it into a monument. Okay, so the state heritage body made it look like that. Okay, if you think that's bad, this is what we did to Berkhamsted Castle. There's Berkhamsted Castle, a beautiful Mott and Bailey Castle. Okay, that's what you see today. Well, then this is the 1930s. That is a digger in the moat creating it so it looks like what you see today. Because we wanted you not to be confused by an earthwork that had lots of trees on it. We wanted you to understand the simplicity of a modern baby castle. Okay. The thing I love about this is this slide here. So here's me, obviously, the inspector of ancient monuments. <laughs> here are you archaeologists, okay? Uh, oh, and here are the workforce, the actual people doing the work. What this kid's actually doing, I don't know, but I would quite like to read. The other great thing is, this was the proposed uniform for the Inspector of Ancient Monuments in 1913. Yes, I have a whip and I have spurs, because my job was to come and tell you what to do, what your heritage was. Now, there, this is important stuff, because this has a legacy. And here is the worst legacy I've ever read, OK? This was written by a very, very, very eminent architectural historian. What can the architectural recorder say about Castleford? There does not seem to be a single building in the centre of the town which would justify a mention. That's written in the 1960s, and what that actually meant is no heritage person went to Castleford ever again, to the degree that the population ended up feeling like they were worthless, that their place had no meaning. There's a really proactive heritage group there, and it's led by someone called Alison Drake. She's fantastic. And obviously, Castleford is a coal mining site. It's a really, really heavily industrialised thing. And this is, she gave a presentation once where she showed this slide. This is their civic office, OK, built in the 1960s. And she says of this building, we can't believe it. They built us this beautiful building, and it looks like another slag heap. What we like about this building now is it's the only slag heap we have left, OK? Because again, the way we've approached heritage in that place Coal mining is seen as dirty, bad heritage, let's just clean it up. 
Let's make it into beautiful parks. Okay. The other thing that's really fascinating is actually when I've gone round and I start doing my job and I go on heritage sites and on Cheddar Monuments, what I've started finding is all these bricks that say Castleford on them. So it's actually not that Castleford's got no heritage, it's actually their heritage isn't in Castleford, it's actually all over the north of England because it's really fascinating what they built with Castleford bricks. So this photograph is actually taken from a World War II um, anti-aircraft observation point on the top of a scheduled monument, uh, modern Bailey Castle that is on the top of an Iron Age hill fort. Okay? It just doesn't happen to be in Castleford. Now what am I saying here? I'm saying some of the problems we've actually got about representation stem for how we talk, deal and manage the stuff. Just go to the MPPF, archaeological interest. It's all about expert investigation. That's it, that buggers anyone here who is not a professional archaeologist, you're allowed to stay in the room, everyone else goes out. Okay, because the public, they're not the experts, are they? So what role do they actually have to play? To me, this is a real, real issue. If we want to do proper representation, we need to actually address issues like this. We need to address the obsession with fabric. This building here is Geston Crimes and Rotherham. It's a grade two listed building. Okay? Quite frankly, it's a pretty crap building. Okay? But this is where the high pressure screw down tap was invented. So if you've all washed your hands today, excellent, you've got this company, Geston Crimes. Thank you. It's said they invented the New York fire hydrant. So much so that this area of Rotherham is actually known as New York. They built a new football stadium next to this and they call it the New York Stadium. Okay, if you know Rotherham's recent history, right, I use this as a conversation about asseration. Rotherham, guests and crimes, were fundamentally responsible for the provision of safe, clean drinking water to the cities of the world with the creation of their valves and brass manufacturing. How do we use that story? Not the building, the story of the ingenuity that went into what was made there. Again, we've got to look at ourselves and our processes. Designation uh, of heritage assets has a real role to actually play in this because actually we have set criteria they're given to us, they're given to us by government. But how do we interpret those criteria? This is Bolton Abbey uh, in the Yorkshire Dales. It's a fantastic site. Um, at the very heart of it is a scheduled ancient monument and a grade one listed building. Okay? The scheduled monument is listed because it's an Augustan priory and then the church is listed partly because it's the Augustan priory but also it's had works by Street and Pugin in it. However, not one of the list descriptions for any of the assets in this area actually mention the fact that Turner was inspired by this landscape and he painted at it. Not only Turner painted at it, Wordsworth wrote poetry in it. Ruskin actually talks about this landscape as being one of the iconic English landscapes of all time. Okay? Not one of the heritage designations actually mentions this. Okay? And this is where we've got to really fundamentally pull apart designation criteria and how we manage places. And what I use very much is English heritage conservation principles and looking at this idea of looking at significance in its totality through the headings that are actually there where you can bring in all these other stories, all these other aspects and start linking them back to the place and really importantly, bring in the communal value. Now, as a lifelong passionate supporter of Yorkshire Cricket Club, I can tell you the most important thing about Bolton Abbey is it's where Fred Truman is buried. Okay, so it's a place of pilgrimage to Fred Truman's grave. How do we actually deal and add these things in? I was really lucky to actually have to go and deal with a spot designation uh, uh, issue with two uh, headstocks at Hatfield Colliery, the last deep mine in the Doncaster uh, coal field. It failed, it closed, it was just about to be demolished, and what do we do is we spot listed it in the middle of one of the government's top housing priority sites. So I had to go out there and actually talk about it. And it's designated because of the very, very high technical specifications that these headstocks had to uh, have. But when I got out there, I got a totally different story. So I met the community, I met the miners, and they spoke about it differently. They referred to Hatfield as their angel of the north. This was their way marker. This is how they understood their landscape. Most importantly with pits, it, the headstock normally relates to the village. Okay, so Hatfield, 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 uh, Collier, Stainmore. But what they also said here is these headstocks became important because Hatfield survived so long it actually started to employ people from all over the north of England from the former coal mining areas. Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, North Yorkshire. They all came to this pit in the end. And so they actually called Hatfield a gypsy pit. 
And actually, this really became about movement through the landscape. So actually, the technical stuff wasn't really so important in keeping it, because that's all documented elsewhere. What's really important is actually their presence in the landscape. How do we actually manage that, and how do we do that? And again, you can do that very quickly, mind map that out using conservation principles. Again, you can just see where all the communal value actually lies. I don't get that from a list description. I have to actually go and talk to people. I actually have to listen to what they're saying. Here's another brilliant example. Uh, the Eye of York in, in the centre of York in Clifford's Tower. Okay, uh, most of you might have heard of this, all the problems about how to develop this site and how to do it. Okay, what's not written is the other histories about this place. It's the site of at least two uh, areas of where public executions used to happen. Here and just back here, there's what, that, that there is the last drop. Okay, there's really interesting and um, difficult history about Jewish massacre that actually happened in Clifford's Tower. But more than that, it's where important events happened. Proclamations of kings and queens <coughs> happened in this space. Okay, elections. This is an interesting election from 1807. We have a Mr. Milton, that's, uh, that's the uh, Fitzwilliam family. We have a Mr. Wilberforce, and we have a Mr. Lascelles. Okay. What you're actually seeing here, in this space here, is the entire debate about anti-slavery happening. Because Wilberforce is William Wilberforce of uh, anti-slavery, and Mr. Lascelles is the Lascelles of Harwood, who owned substantial estates in Barbados. And uh, if you go to Barbados and open up the phone book, you'll see pages and pages and pages of people called Lascelles or Harwood. Okay. But how does that actually happen in real life when you actually look at it? Well, again, mind map this one out. Let's have a look at what the communal values. Let's listen to actually how all these values actually come out. You can go from really humble things. Dick Turpin down here is there. It was an area of protest. Richard Ostler, he actually introduced the 10-hour act. So the reason why we don't all work all day anymore is because of this guy. He marched through the whole of North of England, ended up in the Eye of York. Okay? And we did this to actually try and get people to understand heritage significance in the round. When heritage consultants have looked at this place, all they do is list what are designated. It's scheduled monument, it's grade one listed buildings, it's in a conservation area. Yes, it is all those things, but it is so much more. And what's fascinating when you look at this is the connection between the communal and the historic values. They are overriding, they're overpowering in how they are. And what we do, and what was really, I think is really important, is how we legitimize some of those values. So in our statement of significance for this site, we wrote this. The place has had a direct impact on people. There is a profound link between power, space, buildings, and people at York Castle, made more dramatic because so many of the players are named individuals whose lives, and in many cases their final moments, can be recreated. The names range from the great and the good to the humble and express the drama of conscience, belief, social justice, process, uh, sorry, protest and the criminal. Ultimately, the key to significance of this place is the social and communal value of the site derived from that history and the values people attach to it today. Okay? This is really important. We do heritage management today. We don't do it in the past and we don't do it in the future. How do we do this debate today? Now, I've been watching with a great deal of fascination how we've been trying to rewrite conservation principles. Okay? And personally, I find it a real worry this is a word search on the uh, current conservation principles from 2008, and it's all about values and place. When we actually look at the new version, it comes across as heritage and asset. Um, I just think we're running back to 1882 here. Okay, How do we broaden that out and do that differently? Why should we do it? Well, ultimately, one thing I've learned in my job is that actually nothing is right in heritage. There are no right answers. What we can achieve possibly are good answers, the best answers are based on our knowledge. And I'll just introduce this little conundrum for you. This is called the paradox of Theseus's ship. Most people know it as my grandfather's axe or trigger's broom. Okay, so my grandfather's axe, really simple. Uh, this is my grandfather's axe. My father replaced the handle, I replaced the blade. Is it still my grandfather's axe? Okay. Why is it called the Paradox of Theseus' ship? Theseus went off from Athens, slew the Minotaur in Crete, came back to Athens, they were so happy they kept his ship. And they kept it, and they kept repairing it, and they kept replacing it. After 500 years, they realised they'd place, replaced half of it, so they asked themselves the question, is it still Theseus' ship? And do you know what? After two and a half thousand years, we still don't have an answer. Because the answer is what you want it to be. Okay? 
Now, just for you younger folk out there, here we go. This is the Sugar Bates. Okay, these are the original three members. Well, one by one, they all leave and they get placed by these lovely three ladies. Okay, these then three reform, but they can't call themselves the Sugar Bates. Who are the Sugar Bates? Okay, now, just so I know some of you are middle aged, it's Fleetwood Mac. Okay, because uh, that's exactly the same problem going on with Fleetwood Mac. All right, no answer for these things, but these are the debates that are actually going on all the time that are actually out there. And, you know, it's happening with heritage. Here's HMS Victory. Probably only 5 to 10% of the ship laid down in 1765 because it's been through several wars, battles, it burnt down, it got bombed by the German Air Force. Okay, but every generation has this headline Restorers face a last chance to preserve HMS Victory. What are we preserving? Okay. When I was seven, I bought a piece of HMS Victory. I was so excited, I got this transmission. Um, I now realise I bought a piece of a piece of a piece of a piece, and how, who knows how, well, it might have only been five years old, I don't know. But the great thing is, I've actually lost it now, so it doesn't really actually matter, okay? <laughs> oh look, Stonehenge. Lovely bit of authentic heritage for you, okay? Same problem, what have we actually done to these places over time? And really, I get to this point, well, what does this actually all mean, okay? Well, one of the things I do want to point out, these are the guys, these are the inspectors who are doing that. What they were doing was what they felt was right for their time. And actually, I really respect them because they were brave to intervene in places. Okay? And they said why they were doing it. And I could go on for hours about that. This is the wheel in York. Okay? There was huge <coughs> arguments about putting this up because it affected York Minster. Okay? It was eventually up and it was up for three years. And it was up for the life of my daughter from the year she was born till she was three. Okay? When she was three, we were walking along the river and she saw it being taken down. She turned around to me and she said, Daddy, why are they taking my wheel away from me? Okay. That had been entirely part of her geographic sense, her place. Okay. Who are we to dictate what the future should be interested in? Okay. We're not going to be there. Okay. So again, we can do what we do today. Which today is really important. Okay. And this idea of heritage and fact, I have a real problem with. Heritage and truth, what is it? The legal system doesn't search for the truth. The legal system searches for facts. And if anyone knows when a trial goes wrong and people are, people are put away for not doing something because the facts said they did, but they didn't, that's exactly the same with heritage. We can get the facts wrong. Facts can be wrong. Um, the way I like to try and articulate what this is to everybody is that heritage values, values are like a sound wave. They, they oscillate, they're going along. Okay? The only problem is that they die out. They die out unless we jump in and massively turn them up and do stuff with them. Okay? So here's my sound wave. My problem is, so well, as a heritage manager, is I just don't deal with my sound wave. I deal with everyone's sound wave. There's multiple sound waves. They're all going up and down. They're all in conflict. Okay? They're all disagreeing with each other. How do we actually deal with those? And the way you deal with it is you just go and find really fun things to do and, and interesting things to do. Okay? So I mentioned Castlewood Bricks. I have a really sad part of my life. I don't spot them now and they just turn up absolutely everywhere, and I can date range them, and it's just like amazing. And then, oh, oh look at this, I don't spot Keston Trimes valve covers. They're everywhere, yeah? This is the true value of Keston Trimes. You can see physically the impact of this amazing factory in the town of Rotherham, but you see it all over the country. So going back to those original photographs, why were I showing you this? This is the grave of William Sharrow, it is in Sheriff Hutton in North Yorkshire. Sheriff Hutton is a place blessed with designated heritage assets. It doesn't have one castle, it has two. Okay? It has a parish church that's grade one. Not only is it a parish church with lots of humble people built, buried in it, it also supposedly has the only Prince of Wales buried in a parish church. When we go to this community and we went and we were doing some work with them the first time, we asked them what, what they liked about their heritage. We got shown the church, we got shown the castle, and then we said, why are you showing us these things? He said, well, that, that's, is that what you want to look at? And no, what do you really like? And they took us to this gravestone. And the reason why they took us to this gravestone, unlisted, is it's the, it's the gravestone of the father of this gentleman here, Sergeant William H. Sharrow, who was General Custard Star Sergeant at the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, which is where he died, at the Battle of Little Bighorn. And if you go and look at the records, it actually says, William H. Sharrow, born Sheriff Hutton, North Yorkshire. And this is what the village is actually like a completely undesignated piece of heritage that's possibly quite important to several million Americans, but also probably quite controversial to another group of Americans. But again, a really interesting idea of actually where places and things can actually take you in terms of stories. My war memorial, 
Okay? The eagle-eyed amongst you would have noticed the three names in the middle. They're the ones I'm really interested in when I ran past this in York. And they are three women. I know they're women because their first names are actually written on it. And what they are are three of the 36 women who were killed in this place here, which was a munitions factory east of Leeds. It's called Farmbo. Okay? When the uh, First World War commemoration starts happening, historic England and stuff, decided we'll do something and we'll create lots of, we'll upgrade lots of war memorials as part of our listing. Okay? It took me three months to get this listed. It took me 10 years to get the factory site where they died scheduled as an ancient monument because it didn't fit in quickly with the processes for deciding whether something should be scheduled or not. Ooh, what's the total population of First World War munitions factories? And I'm saying, I don't really care. Actually, this is where 36 women died. How do we represent that? How do we actually deal with that? And then my final one, and this is my final slide. Why did I show you that picture uh, of a piece of stone sculpture? Well, to my mother, it's a really interesting piece of heritage because she was born in Dublin in 1941. Okay, and uh, this is what it was. And some of you have been watching the discussions that are going on, uh, how interesting that is. Okay, so this is all that is actually left of me. And it's in one of the local museums. And afterwards, I'll happily talk to you more about that. But again, what's really interesting about my mother being born in Dublin in 1941, she then married a Yorkshireman, um, is my mother was born a British subject. My mother had never been a British citizen. Okay. And when she wanted to go on holiday to South Africa uh, in about 2002, um, because she's a British uh, subject, she would have ne needed a visa. So she asked about getting her British passport, at which point she was told she'd need to do a citizenship test. Okay. What did my mum do? She got her Irish passport instead, didn't she? I've got my Irish passport. So again, what's my identity in this subject? And I think that's where I go with representation.